Well, this morning, thank you for tuning in, for joining with us. A few of you who are here, we bless you. Those of you Dream Teamers serving today to make this possible. I know there are some of you joining us kind of all over. We are uh, testing Facebook Live this morning. So shout out to the uh, social team and the production team for making that happen. I'm excited, glad to be back with you. Bishop Mott, uh, if you aren't keeping up weekly in this season, I encourage you to do so. But Bishop Mott preached a powerful, powerful prophetic word uh, full of wisdom uh, and the word uh, last week in this Turn the Table series. Uh, but I'm honored uh, to be sharing with you what the Lord put on my heart for you this morning. And I'm excited about it. Um, and I'm praying that right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that you would ask the Holy Spirit to help you tap in to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you, uh, his child, his beloved son and daughter, in Jesus' name. Let's pray right there. Father, we thank you as we've already worshipped you and asked you to dwell here, not just in this room, but in our hearts, the chambers, the rooms of our hearts, God, the places that maybe are far or drifted from you, dwell there. Dwell in that dark place, God. Dwell in that struggle. Dwell in that difficulty. Dwell there. Dwell in the, in the room that nobody knows exists in my heart or my mind. Dwell there. Dwell in that marriage, God, that nobody knows what happens behind those closed doors. Dwell there. Dwell on the other side of the, the bed where the spouses are turned away from each other and they don't know what the other's thinking. Dwell there. Dwell. And God, remind us this morning as we listen or watch or partake of this message in this moment with you, that you're faithful. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Come on, right there, I can't, I can't hear you. Amen. Amen, praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but this quarantine life, I know we're in phase two, and now it's mask everywhere, and there's a spike in there's talk about, are we going back to phase one? Are things going to get closed back down and quarantine? And honestly, it's like this big rush. Even my, my daughter was like, Dad, I just, they're just, I mean, I just, I need that. I need, the, I need to get out. I just, I need to get out. And it's almost like there are some things in this quarantine season that we're feeling like we can't live without. I heard a commentator on ESPN just yesterday say, I, I don't even care if it's, it's rec league basketball at this point. I just need some sports in my life. And maybe a, a gentleman watching or a, a lady who's a sports fan, you could say, hey, man, I just need something to watch. I'm tired of watching cornhole tournaments and replays of all. I, I just feel like I need some stuff. And we're actually saying that in this difficulty, there's some things that we're without that are affecting us. And it's been said that you can live weeks without food. Now, some of us could live a few more weeks than others. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen on that, but them quarantine snacks are catching up to a brother in the name of Jesus. You could live weeks without food. It's said that you can go a few days without water. And studies show that you could go a few minutes without air. But you know what you can't go one moment without? Hope. A moment without hope is hard to recover from. And if I'm honest, as we are in turn the tables, the Holy Spirit told me at the beginning of this series when I was at my lake in my time of prayer that we have to turn the tables in this season from despair to hope. That some of you don't realize it, but hopelessness is setting in. And some of you say, well, I'm not hopeless, Pastor. I'm doing pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm in the storm, but my, my boat is afloat. And the Lord told me to tell you that just because you're not hopeless without hope doesn't mean that you aren't with less hope. You are hopeless. See, I can be hopeless or I can be in a place where I'm hoping less, that I don't realize that, that I'm just in a place now where I'm kind of just surviving this season, that I'm just kind of tolerating and, and I'm no longer expecting anything in my life where I'm just kind of, Lord, I don't even have a conscious prayer as much as it's just like, Lord, just help me. And I want to suggest to you that some of you don't realize that you may not be hopeless, but you have less hope 
And some of you don't even realize this, but I asked the Holy Spirit because I said, Lord, a lot of the people I'm talking to from the church are, they seem to be doing okay. And he said to me, this word for some is a right now word. And he said, for others, this is an advanced word. Pastor, that doesn't sound like, is the Lord prophesying doom? Nope. But he's saying that if you don't get this message today, that you're doing okay because the wind and the waves, the forecast right now is pretty decent. But what happens if our children don't go back to school? What happens if the layoffs take place? What happens if we go back into phase one? What happens if there's another hashtag? What happens to you? Because many of you don't realize it. You aren't at a place where your hope is where it should be. You're at a place where you're hoping in the forecast around you and what's happening. And if what's happening shifts, your hope can shift. And I'm telling you in advance that God is trying to prepare you for things that happen. For in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so today, I want to help us and help me turn the tables from despair to hope. And some of you are saying despair, that's a strong word, Pastor. Yeah, but for some of you, the, the, the path to despair has started with your disappointment. And for some of you, the path to despair, you don't realize you're on the path to despair because you're just at the exit of difficulty. And others, you have progressed down that path and you're at the place of delay. Where you thought this would be over by now. I, we prophesied the end of corona. I thought I wouldn't see this level of racism again. I thought I had marched and picketed and, and protested and, and changed laws and voted. But here we are. And the delay is on the path to despair. And I would encourage you this morning that the enemy's goal in this season is to drown you in despair. See, I may not be there right now, Pastor, but if the enemy can get enough waves and enough wind, you can get to a place where you are drowning in the difficulty. You are drowning in the disappointment. You are drowning in the delay. You're drowning in the despair. And some of you right now, you don't even realize it, but you're drowning in depression. Like, I just feel like I'm tired and I don't want to do anything. I can't get out of bed and I'm just eating. That's the onset of depression. Some of you, the despair you think is just a result of the season. But I want to prophesy the Lord told me to tell you that that's not just despair. That's a demonic spirit of suicide. It's a give up. I don't have anything left to give, spirit. It's a take your life. It's a throw in the towel. It's a quit the marriage. It's I'm going to leave the family. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to let go of God. I'm going to give up my hope. And that is the spirit from hell. And so this morning, no matter where you are on the hope highway, I believe that God has a path for us to hope where we're not going to be drowning in despair, but we're going to be anchored in hope. And in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, they'll throw it on the screens there if you're watching. And if you're in the room, a few of you who are, you can turn with me in Hebrews chapter 6. One of my favorite passages of scripture. And we read it and we think it's, it sounds good and it preaches good, but we don't realize the power that it holds. In fact, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, the heading in my Bible of this, this little section of Scripture, this portion and passage, says the certainty of God's promise. Hebrews 6, 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Let me give you just a little Bible history for a moment. God has promised Abraham a son, a descendant from which the lineage would come forth. He made him that promise, but can I just give you a spoiler alert? It took 25 years to get it. And so verse 15, and so after waiting patiently 25 years, and some of us can't wait three weeks. Can I just tell you and just get this out the way real quick? The delay is not denial. 
The delay, God told me to tell you, is development. See, sometimes you think that the delay, that it hasn't happened yet, is proof that God's not on the scene. But I would actually want to prophesy and tell you that the d- d- delay is God's goodness to you on display. What do you mean? It would not be a good God to give you something that you were not ready to handle. And so for some of you don't realize that it's be, you're being delayed not because you've been denied, but because God says, I know it's for you and I want you to have it and I want it to bless you. So I will develop you through the delay in a way that you would be underdeveloped if I gave it to you right now. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. In verse 15, people swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make, listen to me, the unchanging nature of his purpose, the unchanging purpose, very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath and God did this so that by two unchangeable, does anybody see a theme, unchanging, unchangeable, unshakable, Things, listen, it is in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope, everybody say hope. hope. Come on, say hope. hope. Set before us may be greatly encouraged. Some of you say, Pastor, I'm not in despair, but I'm a little discouraged. We'll be greatly encouraged. Why? Verse 19, listen, because we have this hope as an anchor. For the soul, firm and secure. For we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Let's not skip for the soul. What is your soul? It's your mind, will, and emotions. It's the thinking, feeling, choosing, reasoning part of you. And what is he saying? He's saying that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of this season, God has given you an anchor in which my feelings don't have to run my life. In which I don't have to do what I feel or respond the way I feel. That I don't have to let negative thinking run my life. That I don't have to let the reasoning of the world and the demonic spirits that try to influence me. That doesn't have to run my life. Because if you're honest, some of you are not anchored down in hope. You are drowning in your feelings. And you, feelings are a good indicator, but they make a poor navigator. And some of us are drowning in the tide of our feelings. You're drowning and you're being moved by the tide of your thinking and, and the, the things that you're thinking in the season. And what should I do? And you're reasoning like the world. But God says you don't have to be tossed to and fro by what goes on around you or what happens in you. Why? Because I've given you this hope as an anchor for the soul and that hope is firm and secure and so today for the next few moments I want to make sure that we aren't being tossed around or being drowned I want to make sure that we're anchored down and I want to talk to you from that title anchored down let's pray one more time father I thank you that your spirit Lord you're here You're right there in our hearts. You're right there in our rooms. You're right there in our apartments. But God, we need you. And God, I pray against every block that would try to say, I don't need this message or it's not for me. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak now and put the anchor down in our hearts. In Jesus' name, we said together, amen, amen. Well, why aren't we anchored down? We have this hope as an anchor for my soul. Then, Pastor, why aren't I anchored down? Well, could it be, number one, that we don't really understand what hope is? See, we have this hope, but I wonder if you have that hope. What do you mean, Pastor? You can say hope, but hope to a child who hopes to go to Disney World is two different things. Hope to a person who just hopes that I'll get the weather will be good today. I just hope that I'll get to play golf tomorrow. I hope that I'll be blessed uh, someday. I hope that, see, there's a hope, listen, that's optimism, which is psychological. But then there's a hope that is rooted and grounded in God's word, and that is theological. See, this hope we're talking about is not some psychological, feel-good, wishful, dreaming, wonderful feeling. See, hope is not wishful. 
Hope is not, ah, I just feel. See, when you base your hope on feelings, you're basing your hope on happenings. And my hope is not based on what's happening around me. This hope is a hope that's anchored, listen, by what's happening in me. We tripped over the anchor. I could preach that, but I'll leave it alone. Listen, listen, I didn't read you the rest of the verse, but here's what you need to read. Firm and secure. Why? Because this hope enters, listen, the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Listen, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What he's saying is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil, which represents the divide between you and God, was torn from top to bottom, which means there's nothing you can do to get to God, which means there's nothing you can do to run from him. Listen, he's saying that when Jesus went there and sat down to be a mediator for you, he brought you with him into God's presence, which means there's nothing around me that should shake me because nothing can take me from the place on the inside where Jesus has brought me. If I sit at the hand of God, the right hand of the Father, what in this world should be able to shake me? See, if I'm inside this safe room, it doesn't matter what happens around me. Has you ever been in a storm and the lights go out and everything begins to shift? But have you ever been in a place, maybe a hotel or somewhere, where they have a generator? See, when the storm affects the power in a normal building... If there's a generator on the inside that's not dictated by what happens on the outside, then no matter what happens on the outside, my inside is secure because I have another source. This is the hope we're talking about. The hope we're talking about is not connected to the outside. It's that Jesus is the generator of my life, that I'm sitting and seated at the right hand of God the Father. And because of that, no matter what happens around me, I know that what's happening in me is that I'm firm and secure with my Father. So this hope's not wishful. It's not based on feeling. It's not based on on what has to happen for me to feel like it's going to go my way. It's not based on my sense. In in fact, if I could give you a couple of thoughts, listen to me. The definition of hope biblically is a confident and joyful expectation that God will do what he promised. There's a confident expectation, not a wish, not I think so, not I hope so. It is a confident exceed. The difference between psychological hope and theological hope is that psychological hope hopes it will happen. Theological hope is confident that it will. And let me just suggest to you that many of you, what the enemy's doing through these situations is he's not just attacking your hope. He's robbing you of your faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if I come to God without faith, I shouldn't think that I will receive anything from God. And so what you don't realize is through hopelessness, the enemy's attacking your faith. Because I can't have faith when I don't have hope. Hope is the blueprint. Faith is the construction materials to my future. What I'm saying is if you lose hope, if you don't believe for anything or have any expectation for anything, then you don't need faith for anything. And so by making you feel hopeless, it'll never change or it won't work or no hope. Then you don't release any faith. And if I don't release any faith, I'll never have any of the promises of God fulfilled in my life. And what I'm saying is that it is a confident and joyful expectation based on God's word. Listen, I will tell you it's not based on what I sense. It's based on what God said. It's not based on my emotion. It's based on what God has spoken. It's not based on my imagination. It's based on God's obligation. It's not in my wishes. It's in his word. It's not in what I feel. It's what God has revealed. And so God, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. 
nor hath it entered into the mind of man what God has prepared, the future, a hope for tomorrow. Some of you don't even believe for a tomorrow, and if you do believe for a tomorrow, you're not confident in what that tomorrow will be. Do you wake up expecting now to see and experience the promises of God? Are you waking up expecting for a spike in the news or for another hashtag or for this to happen? And we have let go of our hope. And we wonder why our days are filled. Hope is not based on what's happening to me. Hope is based on who's holding me. The old song said, On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking Sand, And I want to suggest that not only do we not fully understand biblical hope, but we have placed our hope in all the wrong things. See, some of us don't realize it, but we're placing our hope in an election. If one man on this earth can either change my situation for the good or for the bad. See, humans who know no God place their hope in government because government is the next highest form of authority that we can create in our own human element. And could I suggest that the, even the church, I'm all about voting and you should vote. As a believer, you should be active in your faith and voting and prayerful and praying. But at the same time, if your hope is in an election and in a man, listen to me, when we talk about this demonic spirit of racism that's in our society, if your hope is in the goodness of another human, See, I don't, I don't have time to speak this, but one of the concerns about this hope that we're putting in when we take God out of the racism equation is that you are basically putting your hope in human nature. And what we're basically saying is that people are morally good. But the theology of the Bible is that no one is morally good. Only God is good, that we are born with a sinful nature. So you should almost expect humans who don't know God to have a sinful nature. What I'm saying is we're putting our hope in people and not in God. Is your hope in your status? Is your hope in your savings? Is your hope in your, your 401k and your 403b, your, all your Roth IRA and your stocks and your bonds? and your, your Where's your hope? Is your hope in your, your spouse will one day change? Your hope is in your child will one day. Where is your hope? Because all of the ground, sinking sand. And I want to suggest to you that when you put your hope on anything, I'm not telling you not to, not that we don't go to those things as, as supplements and supports, but only God is the source of hope. Listen, Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. One translation says, may God, the source of hope, the source, he's the God of hope, the source of hope. So if I go to anyone else looking for hope, if I'm looking for my children's behavior that day to change how I'm feeling about my parenting, if I'm looking for Pastor Tamika to love me in a way that makes me feel different about myself, if I'm looking for, for the, the change in the world, if I'm looking for the police office, I, I'm, I'm believing for that, but I'm believing in God to be the one who touches them and shifts it. See, it's a subtle shift of where I place my hope. See, one is placing your hope in the forecast, and the other is placing your hope in him. See, if I have my hope in him, then no matter what the forecast does, no matter what the wind and the waves do, and I'm believing God to change the wind and the waves and the people, but if I'm anchored as my source in him, doesn't matter what goes on with them. And I want to suggest to you, we overlook this scripture, but listen, re, re, listen. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Let me read that again. Christ Jesus, our hope. 
can I suggest to you that hope isn't even a thing? That hope is a person? And that hope has a name? And his name is Jesus. And the scripture tells us that we have entered into this living hope. How can hope live? Because it lives through Jesus. That the fact that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. See, this, this may be too deep for you, but listen to me. If he conquered death, hell, and the grave, then what in your life can he help you conquer? And the fact that he conquered death, hell, and the grave, the hope is that one day he's coming back for me and he will deliver me out of this world. But until then, the hope of my salvation is that he'll cover me in it. Yeah. And so, Pastor, I hear all that, but you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> and I feel you. Because if I'm honest and I got to hurry... This season is the perfect storm to take your hope and make you lose faith. What do you mean? In fact, I read a study. It was a, a pastor, a very famous pastor who's a very um, serious man of God named Rick Warren. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life. He, he wrote a book on hope many years ago. And as God was speaking to him about hope, I watched, I, I, I watched the article, I watched the, the, the preview of, of this book. He was teaching on hope and was writing on hope. And he got diagnosed with a sickness on a Thursday. In the hospital, got released on Sunday. And he was supposed to preach on hope that day. But he couldn't make it. And on Monday, his son, who was battling mental illness, committed suicide. So here God is talking to you about hope. <laughs> and now I have reason to give up hope. And so it sent him on a journey of study of hope. And he did a, a clinical study on the 10 reasons, not just in the church, but in the world. The top 10 reasons for hopelessness. Let me give them to you. And let's see if it resonates with where we are right now. Number one. Top 10 reason for hopelessness, when you feel alone or isolated. Ding, 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 quarantine. Ding, 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 six feet apart, social distance. And it's when you feel alone or isolated or abandoned. That, that there's no one that's there for me. God, where are you in this? It hasn't changed yet. I'm by myself. I, I'm the only minority on my job. I'm the only believer in my family. God, I don't have anybody around in quarantine. God, I feel alone. Number two, when life seems out of control. Like, I can't change it. I don't have the power to change it. I don't know if it will change. I wonder if it'll change. It's never going to change. I can't control it. There's nothing I can do. I mean, it's almost where we become a victim of our circumstances. Right now, we wish we could control the curve. We wish we could stop another hashtag. We wish we could control the racism, but it feels like every time we try, there's another thing that happens. Like, I could, can I control whether they do the layoffs or not? Can I control whether they open school or not? Like, I have no control. Number three, when you don't see a purpose. The studies show that we can tolerate pain when we understand the purpose. But we don't, as humans, know how to process purposeless pain well. What am I saying? When you don't see the purpose in your pain, you don't process that pain well. And you begin to lose hope because you don't see the purpose within it. Number four, when you're grieving a loss. Death of a loved one. Coronavirus. The death of another in which we see ourselves. For many people, watching Ahmaud Aubrey be murdered was the grief of a loss, even though you didn't know him. For watching someone else in your season or situation go through something can make you grieve that same loss. It could be a job loss. It could be the loss of a relationship. It could be the perception of a loss in that relationship. And God told me to tell you, for some of you, it's not one major loss. It's a series of minor setbacks. Number five, for hopelessness, top ten reason number five is when you don't have what you need. 
Not just your basic needs of money and resources and food and shelter, but energy, grace. When you start to think as a mom, I just don't have the energy for this. I don't have the skill to homeschool my kids again and go to work. I don't have this. I don't have it. And what the study said is that when you feel like you don't have what you need and then you can't self-generate it, you begin to get hopeless. Number six, when you've done something wrong, guilt, shame, regret, or remorse. Some of you are saying, Pastor, you're looking at this season and you're saying, if I'd have done that, I wouldn't be in this situation. Maybe I couldn't have controlled the season, but I could have controlled how I was prepared for it. And the enemy, through the spirit of condemnation, is beating you up and is making you feel hopeless. I would say for some of us, think about it, when when we're, we're just battling What did I do? What did I do? But not just what you do. Number seven, listen, reason for hopelessness is when you've been deeply wounded or experienced trauma. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual abuse even. Do you realize that a global pandemic is supposed to psychologically leave people with PTSD? Because we've never been here before. Some people are in this room right now worshiping with a mask on. Some of you aren't even in this room I would suggest to you even the racial trauma that many of our black and brown brothers and sisters are facing. You don't realize what that does to your soul. And people can tell you, just get over it. But you don't realize the depth of watching another video and the re-traumatization of what you went through. Number eight, when you're pulled in the wrong direction, in, in our church terms, we call it temptation. People begin to feel hopeless when they feel like there's something continuing to pull them in a way they know they shouldn't go, but they can't stop doing it. I.e., when you feel like you're overweight, but you just can't stop eating. When you know you're not supposed to watch that pornography, but you keep being drawn to it. What happens is afterwards, the enemy says, see, you're just never going to get past that. They're just right where you are. You thought you were different, but it won't change. You feel trapped by that behavior, attack, or habit. Number nine, listen, what's crazy is you're hounded by fear. This season is the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. You go to your mailbox and you don't know if the mailman or Amazon man touched your package with the virus. You don't even know what you go to the store. Will it be okay? Could I go to the drive through at church or the drive-in? What do I do? You're not even sure if your husband should go for a run in the community anymore. You're not even sure if your son should be driving right now because of the tension racially in the police. You Like literally, we're hounded by fear, but we excuse it away because we've settled it as low-level anxiety. But can I suggest that when you live on a constant state of eggshells you are under a pressure where at some point you will eventually crack under the spirit of that fear number 10 top 10 reason for hopelessness is when it looks like defeat like I can't see any positive in this anymore we're in another spike will kids go back to school is 2020 basically over Right now I'm staring at a room that seats 1,200 people. And yes, the church has not been closed and we have been clothing and feeding and ministering and attacking things in our city with the power of God and the graciousness of your giving. And we're still ministering and having small groups and et cetera. But the reality is there's something still missing because we are created for corporate fellowship then to go back out. But, but will this change? Like, Lord, did you give us a building for us to just record in? Because my basement was pretty decent. It didn't cost me anything. I already paid that. Where's the positive in more quarantine? Where's the positive in another issue being revealed at my job? Where's the positive in this situation? Pastor, don't you think that that's a good reason for me to be hopeless or have less hope? In the natural, you're exactly right. But how then is it that God told us we have this hope as an anchor, firm and secure? That we should overflow with hope. That we should be joyful in affliction. Like, 
patient in hope. Fervor, like where, where does the Bible get off telling us to have a hope when we have all the reasons to be hopeless? Well, I want to suggest that if God has offered us an anchor and we're not experiencing it, it's because we haven't attached ourselves to the anchor he's given. And what I want to tell you is that some of you have been given this anchor. You've been questioning if God is there. The anchor exists, but if I cut the chain from the anchor, it's as if I have no anchor. Or if I have the chain on the anchor, i.e. I have a relationship with God, but I don't have the anchor attached to me, it's as if the anchor does no good. Here's what I'm saying, church. The point of an anchor, number one, is to give you security and safety in a storm. But if you're not attached to the anchor, the storm will take you out. Number two, the point of an anchor is not just for a storm. It's to create stability in a season. If you go fishing and you want to sit in that area and fish because you found a hot spot, a pocket, a school of fish, and you don't put the anchor down, you'll begin to drift. And let me speak to that drift really quickly. Some of you are beginning to drift and you don't even know it. Because drifting's easy and you don't realize how far you've drifted. Can I speak to some of you right now who will turn this on on about Wednesday or Thursday? But the beginning of this season, you used to wake up at 945 and scramble to brush your teeth and get in front of the TV to hear a word and take notes. And now you're at a point where, well, I'll just listen to it on my way uh, to work. And there's nothing wrong with that unless... You have drifted from a place of expectation for God to speak to you. Some of you have drifted away from where, uh, church, I don't really know. Some of you have drifted from God. Some of you have drifted from your small group where the small group leader is hounding you. Like, why are you kidding? How they, because you need the connection and you don't even know that you've drifted. Some of you are drifting in your marriage and you don't even realize it. Like you used to, just date night hasn't happened in a couple weeks and now you feel a little bit apart. And now you wonder why your eyes are a little shifty when you walk outside or where on your on Instagram. Instagram, you're drifting and you don't even know it. Some of you, God told me to tell you, you're doing the same thing, but don't realize you've drifted. Here's what I mean. You're still reading the word. You're still tuned into the service right now. You're doing it. You're fishing, but you don't realize you've left the spot where you were called to be. What am I saying? You can read your Bible in the morning but not read it with an expectancy and a hope that God will speak to you. You can go through this worship service out of obedience and religion, but not out of any type of expectation that God will inhabit your praise. You've drifted and you don't even know it. You ever been to the beach and, and you, you go out in the ocean and you're trying to maybe jump in waves or you're playing in the ocean and you started right here where people were, like your tent was or your umbrella was, and all of a sudden, three minutes later, you're drifted down the beach? You didn't realize it, but the tide of the ocean pulled you an undercurrent. And I want to prophesy to you that if you're not careful right now in this season and attach yourself to the anchor of your soul, that you will be pulled by the undercurrent of the season. And the undercurrent of this season is not just some difficulty. The undercurrent of this season is the spirit of the Antichrist. It is a demonic spirit to pull you and drift you and detach you from God, your father. So what do we have to do? You have to anchor down. Well, how do I anchor down? I got to get some anchor points. Because if I don't have any anchor points, no matter if I have the anchor or not, I won't be anchored. So let me give you these quick anchor points, and I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to worship for a moment. Anybody, you hearing something from the Lord today? You drifted already? Those of you who hear you drifted, your mask got you messed up, huh? Come on, somebody say, speak, Lord. Anchor down, anchor down. Where are my anchor points? Number one, my anchor point is the promises of God. The promises of God. Hebrews 6 says that when God made this promise to Abraham, that the heirs of what was promised, verse 17, that the promises, the promises of God are yes and amen. They're not maybe so, I hope so. They are yes and amen. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, listen, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures 
and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So if I haven't been in the promises and I'm drowning in my problems, I may not have the hope that these promises provide. Psalms 119 verse 50, the word is my comfort in affliction. Your promise has given me life. These promises are not just something that you read. There's life attached to them. They are infused with the DNA of the Father. They have hope and an anointing to break past discouragement and depression. They can di literally discern and divide between joint and marrow, the thought, and, thought and, and, and spirit. Like literally it can discern the thoughts that you have. It can break down soul and spirit. These promises are the power of God. And some of us have just forgotten. Let me give you two quick promises that give you hope. In Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, yeah. says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. He wrote that to a people who were in captivity and who would stay in captivity. Hey, church, God told me to tell you the, pro the purpose is still planned. Your purpose is still planned. And in fact, he told me to tell you it's more grand than you had planned. You know why? Because some of you doubt the purpose is planned because the path has changed. But just because the path is different doesn't mean the purpose is. For I know the plans. You may not, but God does. Give you hope and a future. So no matter what I face, I know that I have hope. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For we know. For we know. Could it be that we forgot what we know? For we know. See, Jeremiah 29, 11, I feel like preaching says, I know, I know, for I know, for I know. And Romans 8, for I know. Maybe you forgot what you know because you aren't anchored in the promises. If there was ever a season when I needed the promises of God to anchor me to the hope in God, it's right now in the midst of a difficult season. Because sometimes it's not the strength of the difficulty, it's the length of the difficulty. And right now we are in both. And so I need more promises for I know that God, that God, not that Brian works, not that Pastor Mac works, that God works. God works. God works even when you don't see him working, even when you don't think he's moving, even when you don't see racism changing, even when you don't see legislation being passed, even when you don't see corona going down. God is working. What is he working? For the good. Which means no matter what it looks like, he's working for the good. If you go eat the cake when you put the batter and the eggs in, you would not think it was good. When I add the flour and not haven't yet added the sugar, it might not taste good. But without the flour, you could put the sugar but the cake would not rise. And what I'm saying is right now you may not feel like it's a sugar season. It may be a flower season. It may be a mix me up season. It may be a sift me season. But it's for my good. God, I'm tired of being stirred and sifted. No, you're being refined. Who does he work that for? Of those who love him? Listen. Listen. And called according, talk to me, to his purpose. So if my purpose had passed, why would God still be working? See, if the order of the calling, if the order of my cake had been canceled, why would the baker still be See, you thought that it was delayed and you thought it was denied. But God is in the kitchen with angels working on your behalf, scurrying in this season to make your 
purpose come to pass. I'm preaching better than you talking. And here's the reality. It's the promises of God. We have these promises. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we now profess. Don't just read them. Speak them. It's the promises of God. But listen to me. Number two, it's the power of God. See, I can anchor myself in promises, and some of you have the promises, but you don't have the anchor that he has the power to do what he promised. And I can believe in a promise, but if you don't believe the person who made the promise can make it come to pass, the promise is no good. If I told you I'm going to pay off all your debt, everybody watching, I'm going to pay off all your debt. That's an amazing promise. Come on, amen. Shout hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to start with me in the name of Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. But y'all don't believe that because you know I ain't got that kind of money. In Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name. You can say that. But even if I had it, did, would I really have the power to do it? Would I even have the character to do it? Here's, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me make it plain. Romans chapter 4, and we'll pray. Romans 4, 18, listen, against all hope. Against all hope, which means hopeless situation, death, 25 years, I'm old, she's old, her womb is dead, I'm not making stuff anymore, them eggs is dry, there's no fertility clinic, there's no help, there's no medicine, we undid this, it's dead, it's gone. Against all hope, comma. See, hope is the comma where you want to put a period. In fact, hope is the exclamation point where the devil wants you to put a question mark. Some of you have been putting a question mark in this season. Uh, Hope, question mark. And God says, no, in hope, exclamation point. And Abraham, against all hope. Listen, Abraham, in hope. When he had every reason to not hope, he made a decision to hope and believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. Listen, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith. Listen to me. You can't have faith without hope. He faced the fact. See, hope isn't some just ignorant thinking that I don't see what's going on around me. Hope is that I can face the facts. And in spite of the facts, the facts can change because of the one who can change the facts. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Listen to verse 20. This is the point. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Verse 21. Why? Because he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. What am I saying? You know that God, you can trust in God's promises and anchor yourself in them because God is the one with the power to make them come to pass. Don't you ever forget some of you have forgot that he is the Lord that healeth thee. Why? Because the, he's the one who made your body, so he's the one who can heal it in the name of Jesus. He's the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide for you in ways. If he can part the sea, then he can make a way for you. If he can stop the, if he can stop the Red Sea, then he can stop a layoff. You forgot that he is the God of all power. Do you realize who we serve? The Lord told me to tell you, you must have forgot. Allow him to reintroduce himself. His name is not Jehovah. His name is Jehovah. Put you in a Jesus track and allow him to reintroduce himself. His name is Jehovah Jireh. His name is Jehovah Nisi. His name is Jehovah Shalom. Because I have the power. I am that I am. What you need. Forget who he is. Don't forget who we serve. There is no problem you face that is greater than the God you serve. There is no problem you face, Trey, that is greater than the God you serve. In Isaiah chapter 40, listen to me real quick. We quote this scripture all the time. Anybody ever heard this? And this will preach right here. Verse 31. Oh, we'll start in verse, verse 30. Even you grow tired and weary. But young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's an excellent promise. But do you know this was written as an entire chapter? 
And it was a prophetic word from God to the children of Israel. And the heading of the chapter in every translation is comfort for God's people. In fact, verse 1 of every one, God speaks and says, comfort, comfort my people. Comfort, comfort my people. The end is hope. The beginning is comfort, comfort. How does he give them comfort, comfort, and help them have hope? You have to look in the middle. We don't read the middle. We just read the promise, and we forget the power of the one who promised. Listen, here's what he told them to get comfort from. <laughs> Listen, verse 21, God says, God says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner than they are planted, i.e. elected, no sooner than they are sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows them on and they wither. A whirlwind sweeps them away like the chaff. Listen to verse 25. To whom will you compare me, God says? Who is my equal? Lift up your eyes. Look to the heavens. Who created all of this? And he who brings out the starry host one by one and calls each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, none of them is missing. So verse 27, why do you complain, O'Brien? Why do you complain, O Nikeo? Why do you say, church, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Pause. So now that you done heard about my power, that should comfort you. No racist, no racist around your job can take you from it if God has it for you. No sickness can take you out. When God has the power to deliver you, that the virus might be around you, but the blood on you breaks down the virus in the name of Jesus. What am I saying is we may have forgot who we serve. No layoff. Are you talking about layoff when there's the same God who broke the fish and the loaves and had enough and then 12 basketfuls left over? So therefore, you grow tired and weary. But those who hope, hope in who? The one who has the power to do what he promised. Church, did we forget who he was and the power that he has? Yeah. But listen to me. Number one, the promise of God is an anchor point. Number two, and I'm almost done, the power of God. But number three, it's not just the power of God, it's the person of God. Because you've met powerful people. But if they don't have the personal attributes to be faithful to what they had the power to do, then the promise wouldn't serve you. And here's what I'm saying. Some of you know that God's able. You know that he's capable. But some of you don't have hope because you don't know that God's credible. See, you know that he's capable, but you don't believe that he's credible. And you know what God told me to tell you? He said, you need to keep the receipts. Because when you keep the receipts, when the devil starts to tell you who God won't be, you can say, I got receipts. Yeah. <laughs> I got receipts. Yeah. See, the last time something difficult happened, the last time I thought they were going to slay me, the last time I thought I was going to lose it, the last time I thought I was going to take my own life, the last time they started, this depressing stuff started coming around me, the last time they started accusing me, the last time, the last time, the last time, and you can say in the middle of this time that I got receipts from the last time because I know who my God is. I have proof. What do you mean? Hebrews 6 said that I can trust this promise as an anchor. Why? Because these two unchangeable things, number one, it is impossible for God to lie. If God said it, he'll do it. 
Pastor, is there anything God can't do? Yep, there's two things God can't do. You want to know two things God can't do? God can do all things. No, he can't. He can't do these two things. He can't lie and he can't fail. God cannot lie and he cannot fail. God cannot lie and he cannot fail. Numbers 23, 19. If God spoke, he'll do it. God is not a man that he should lie. Listen to Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Listen, listen. Why? Why do we hold unswervingly? Because for he who promised is faithful. You can check God's track record, church. And some of you have forgot your history with God. And the reason you need to check your history is who he's been to you is a sign of who he'll continue to be. Because he changeth not, even when the situation changes so. He's faithful. He's loving. He's kind and compassionate. And I want to suggest to you that even when you think he's not being very kind because he hasn't done it yet. Romans 5, 3 says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that the suffering develops perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Could I suggest that the lack of hope we have could be a result of the lack of depth we have? And listen to me, God cares more about your development than he does your destination. I know you don't like to hear that, but when we care more about our walk with, with less about our walk with God and more about the place God is taking us, we actually just use God as a tour guide, as a genie to get us to our, rather than a God we walk with intimately and know and serve. I don't have time to teach it, but why does everybody know Jeremiah 29, 11, Minister Tia, but nobody knows verse 12? Everybody quotes 11. Hope in the future. Plans you have for me. You know what verse 12 says? Seek me with all of your heart. And if you seek me, then you'll find me. Why? Because he's saying, I want you to come to me, not just come to me for your destiny. Could your lack of hope be a sign of lack of depth? Or maybe a sign of the fact that we're just treating God in a way that we just use him to get where we want to go rather than be anchored in who he is. And listen, verse 5, we'll close. And hope does not put us to shame. Doesn't disappoint us. (laughs) Doesn't disappoint us, the New American Standard says. In other words, when I put my hope in God, I'll never be disappointed. When I put my hope in his word, I'll never be disappointed. But pastor, I put my hope in his word that my mama would be healed and she didn't get healed. Wait a minute. Did you miss that we serve an everlasting eternal God? And that God was faithful to his word because your grandmama, your mama is healed right now in heaven. There's no suffering there. But pastor, I thought that God said he would be a God of justice, but they got off. They didn't get off. In fact, it just got worse for them. Because he will be just, you will have to give an account for everything done in this body and every idle word spoken. Jesus is the judge. He will make sure and he can't not be just. I'm telling you that there is eternity for God to fulfill his promises to you. And even when you thought he wasn't faithful, he's faithful. So I say hope in him. I heard a preacher say, I'd rather get half of what I hoped for than all of what I didn't believe for. Some of us have let go of hope because we don't want to be disappointed, because hope deferred makes the heart sick. But could I suggest that hope deferred makes the heart sick? But hope departed from makes the heart dead. From despair, disappointment, difficulty, turn the table to hope. How? Anchor yourself in the promises, the power, the personality, the attributes of God. 
That's awesome. But you know how it comes? Note takers, listen. The practices of God. Some of us stopped practicing the practices and we lost the presence. Listen to me. Praise. Psalm 42. Why, O oh my soul, are you downcast within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my God and my Savior. In other words, I will choose hope, and the praise I decide will give me the hope that I need. David encouraged himself in the Lord. When's the last time you praised God yet? You need a yet praise, not a because of praise. It'll give you hope. Some of you note takers, you need to do some proper obedience. Yeah. What do you mean? It's hard to have hope in him when you're not right with him. Yeah. Holy Spirit told me the other day, and I'll just throw this out for you, let you spare you some difficulty. He said, why are you asking me what I have yet to do and not asking me what you've yet to do that I told you to do? Some of you, the practice of God, and you don't have any hope. Listen, it's because you're so busy trying to get hope that you haven't given any hope. It's praise, it's proper obedience, but it's pouring. Proverbs 11.25 says that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. When's the last time you encouraged anybody else? When's the last time even when you were down, you said, you know what, let me call them. Let me check on them when I felt alone. Let me call somebody else and see if they may. What, when's the last time? And lastly, prayer. <laughs> see, we don't think about prayer as a place of hope. But when you really get into the presence of God and you hear God speak to you or you see God move for you, that should give you hope as a reminder that he's still on the scene. <laughs> In fact, Luke chapter 18, verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable, listen, to show them that they should always pray and never give up, never lose heart, never become discouraged. And can I just put a footnote for those of you? He told them they should always pray and never give up in the face of injustice. Read Luke 18, Jerome. It was a woman who was being unjustly treated, and he told her, don't stop praying. I don't want to hear about prayer. You better start praying. And don't give up no matter how long we fight because I'm telling you that you shouldn't always pray and never give up. And really quickly, here's a quick commercial announcement. One of the things that we do as a church every, every week on Wednesdays at 7, 7 a.m., every Wednesday on YouTube, we live stream what we call Pray First. We are a Pray First church that we're determined to pray first and pray always. And what's crazy, and I'm going to close here, is that the first ever Pray First that we held publicly during the quarantine coronavirus season, Pastor Mac led it, and the Lord gave him a word on hope. And the word the Lord gave him on the first Pray First of this whole season was to hold on to hope. And that word actually came almost exactly 90 days ago. And the Lord gave him this word on hope and when he gave it to him, it was as if the Lord was telling us early to hold on to hope. And he gave him this acronym. And I would give it to you, but I wouldn't do it justice. Because there's something about Pastor Mac, who's our associate pastor here, who just, he got that grandfather country voice, and he just kind of get to, get, to, get to going. And so really quickly, I just want to close. And this, this Wednesday, i.e., pray first, you should be on. But I want to close with Pastor Mac and tag team preach him in right now. Pastor Mac. I still want to share with you one other scripture. It comes from Romans 12 and 12, and it says, Be joyful in hope. Yeah. Patient in affliction mm -hmm. and faithful in prayer. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give you what God laid on my heart in reference to hope. See, he says, God is our hope because H, number one, he is our helper. He is our healer. He, he hears us. He is the Holy One. So God is our hope. God is our hope because of, oh, he is our overcomer. 
He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's always there. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everything. God is our hope, Pete, because he is our protector. He is our provider. He is a powerful God. He is, he is a God of all possibilities. That's why God is our hope. God is our hope because of E. He is Emmanuel. He's a God with us. He's the everlasting Father. He's the ever-present God. That's why we have to hold on to our hope because God will never leave us or forsake us. He is our hope. He's our helper, our healer. Come on, that should make you almost shout right there. He's the holy one, which means he's perfect in all of his ways. He's the, oh, he's the overcomer that in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. He's literally the omni-everything, the omnipresent. I'm always with you. I'm the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one. I'm the omniscient one, the all-knowing, everlasting God. I'm omni what you need. He is our peace, our protector, our provider. He, he's our peace. He's our E. He's Emmanuel. He's God with me. He's the everlasting God, which means no matter what comes, it can't stay. And no matter what comes my way, God will see me through it. If that doesn't give you some hope, I don't know what's wrong with you because he's my hope. And he will never leave us, nor forsake us. And he'll never let us down. He'll never let you down. And we have this hope, and that hope does not disappoint. It does not put to shame. So I'm asking to get your hope up. Anchor yourself down today and get your hope up. Put an anchor in the ground. Put an anchor in the ground. And so I know we're a few seconds over time, but right there at your house and in your apartment, just for a moment, I want you to prophesy the hope that is getting anchored in your soul. not a declaration just of what he's done it's a proclamation of who he will be lamentations chapter 3 verse 19 i remember my affliction and my wondering the bitterness and the gall i well remember my trouble and my soul is downcast within me yet God, right now I speak a yet in the spirit to every downtrodden, 
Every weary, every wondering, every depressed, every suicidal person right now in the name of Jesus. Every person who's divorcing or thinking about divorcing or just drifting. I speak a yet now. This we call to mind. And therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness to me. God, we speak as we close over every person watching those who are listening, no matter when they see this, it may be weeks from now, even months from now. Some of you, God told me as they were singing, you're going to need to replay this. Go ahead and put this in your, your playlist for later because you're going to need, when, see, because hope's not based on what's happening. Hope's based on what I'm holding and who's holding me. So God, we speak a reminder right now, a call to mind reminder of the faithfulness of you, our God, from the beginning to the end, God, that you sent your son to die on a cross for us while we were yet sinners, while we were in difficulty, and while we were even in death. And God, when the last season tried to take us out, the last time we drifted, the last marital difficulty, the last time our son went crazy, the last time our daughter was battling that thing, the last time they talked about letting me go, yet we call to mind your faithfulness. You want a reminder of his faithfulness? You're still here. And if you're still here, he promises to take you there. Great is his faithfulness. So God, we bind every demonic spirit of suicide, of give up. We bind it right now. Hey, if that's you, you've just been having some crazy thoughts. That's not just some crazy thought. That is a spirit from the enemy determined to take your life. Look at me if that's you and you're watching. Do not take your life. Do not make a permanent decision in a momentary situation. The enemy is trying to give you a way out, but that's not a way out. That's a way down. This is not the solution. This is a pain that indicates that we need a solution. Suicide is not the answer, for there is hope against all hope. I'm telling you right now, if that's you, you can even reach out just right in the chat. You can say, I need help, or you can click the link on the, the online service that says info, con contact. We would love to pray and counsel with you and be honored to serve you. And for the rest of us, whether you're hopeless or you're hoping less, I pray right now that you would Put your trust in Jesus. Place an anchor in the ground. For we have this anchor. This hope. It's the anchor to our soul. Firm and secure. And may that song and the faithfulness of God be your song. The rest of this week and even the rest of this season. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you've never made a commitment of your life to Jesus, that is the first place to the anchor. I want you to click the link right there that says, I raised my hand. I made a commitment. We'd love to pray with you as you give your life to Christ in Jesus' name. God bless you. You are dismissed.